That's me, about 12 years old. Cowboy hat, fishing pole. That's my sister. She got her little bunny rabbit. I traveled all over with that thing. My parents in the back. So you can imagine me about that age on chore day, and I'm the mower, and my sister's the raker. And like you, I get pretty bored on chore day. And so I'm like, you know, I think I'm going to spice it up a little. So I wait till my sister gets a big pile. And then I take my mower, poof, boom. <laughs> Which, of course, causes her to do one of these numbers right here. <laughs> Didn't like that. And so she throws right down. Heads inside. And it's at this point that I realize, oh, I may have spiced this up a little bit too much. Both my parents are inside. I have some neighbors on the street doing their chores. I just opened myself up to punishment roulette. And I know today, I know spanking isn't cool. But my parents way back then, they thought spanking was really cool. <laughs> So I'm at that awkward age, right? Boy, man, trying to figure who am I kind of stuff. I hope this doesn't go bad for me with all the neighbors out. So here comes my dad out of the house, looking like he'd rather be anywhere than navigating this dispute between his two kids on his one of two days off this week. My sister's right behind him. <laughs> Look who I found in the house. <laughs> Throat dry, like, like a cat with a hairball. Turn the mower off, put my hands up, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock on the lawnmower. I don't know what's coming. My dad walks up to me. Son, you're not a jerk, so stop acting like one. Pats me on the back, turns around and walks back into the house. My sister is horrified that this is the extent of my punishment. I assure you, she was hoping for something far more punitive. And so I'm sitting there, and my hands are still on the lawnmower, and it hits me like a thunderbolt. My dad doesn't think I'm a jerk. I'm not a jerk. And on that Saturday morning, the very first piece of my identity locked into place. I'm not a jerk. I'm going to try to be nice and be nice to people. My topic today, how negative feedback changed my life. The big idea worth spreading is that we're often reluctant to step into the awkwardness of a negative feedback moment but if we do, we have the potential to be game-changing for somebody and occasionally maybe even life-changing. And what could be more human-to-human -human than that? Conveniently, I went on to study this for a while and I got it down to ABC. <laughs> Three things that tend to separate potentially life-changing or game-changing negative feedback from the type of negative feedback that we all too often experience as criticism and it bounces off our defenses and puts space between people. A stands for altruism. You have to find a good them reason. When I was 28, I left uh, the Army and use my veterans benefits at the completion of my military service to study communication and some of these things. And I was relearning how to become a civilian and I also had no idea how to be a teacher. That wasn't part of what I'd done. And so I was a teaching assistant and I was in the office my second week of graduate school and I was telling a story and it must have had some colorful language in it.
because an old nutty professor with his arm full of books stops in the doorway and goes, hey, we don't talk like that here. Got it? Yes, sir. And that was 22 years ago. And I've never said a bad word in a teaching environment since that day. We're quick to remember the asymmetry in, I know this is going to be awkward, and I don't know the payoff, and so I'm going to avoid the situation. But we forget the other asymmetry, the positive asymmetry. Of this awkwardness may only last for a couple moments, but it could benefit somebody for quite some time. And it may be worth having that awkwardness. How do you know it's altruistic? It's easy. If I tell my wife, I have some feedback for you. First of all, not recommended. <laughs> Secondly, if I say, you know, I think you should chew gum with your mouth closed. What's in it for her? Nothing. What's in it for me? Why don't I like the way she chews her? It's not complicated, you know. What was in it for that old nutty professor? I never took a class from him. I never had another conversation with him. He didn't know any of the other TAs in that room. Nothing was in it for him to hang in that awkwardness for a few minutes and bust into our jokeathon and give me a little tune up. It was for me. You'll know in here if it's for you or for them. If you have a good them reason, that's the first step to game changing feedback. Second, have to build a bridge. They have to kind of want to walk across the bridge. There's a few ways to do this, but I'm going to focus on one because it's the handiest and most effective. To illustrate it, I'll tell you a story. Got a call to come out and observe a bunch of meetings at a company. Basically, they were complaining, oh, our meetings are terrible, and all we do is talk, we never get anything done. Give us some tips. Yeah, sure. So I go out, watch a few meetings, and it becomes apparent into the few minutes in the first meeting that one of the high flyers that I know is destined for great things in this company, shrewd, smart, articulate, she has this quirk where when she answers in the affirmative, Instead of saying yes or yep, she does it like a machine gun. Yep, 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 yep. Yes, 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 yes. And everybody knows because they're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and nobody's saying anything. And so at a break, I get to where it's just the two of us. And I do probably the most effective thing for this B to build a bridge. Ask for permission. Hey, I saw something. I think you may benefit. Are you interested in a little feedback? Now listen, people are very curious. Most of all, they like to know about themselves. So they're almost always going to say yes. And if they say no, you're good. Do not, do not proceed. Because <laughs> that's guaranteed. It's going to bounce, boing, it's going to bounce off. Look, if you can predict the situation, boing, where it's going to bounce off, don't bother. People notoriously don't pick their spot. We pick the wrong spot. We pick the spot where I'm going to say this right now. And there's a saying in communication. It's, as soon as you say it, you feel better. You just screwed up. <laughs> and so I asked her, I saw something in this meeting. Would you be interested in a little feedback? And she said, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> And I said, actually, that's my feedback. <laughs> so what do you mean? I said, you're machine gunning. For some reason, you're affirmative responses, and that's not you. You're the most articulate person in this whole company. She said, oh my goodness. Thank you for telling me. I'm going to stop that. She did. In the book, The Alchemist, Pablo Coelho, the author, wrote, 
Something that happens once will never happen again. But something that happens twice will surely happen a third time. Sometimes the power of negative feedback is that it only takes once and it's out. The C, they have to connect the dots. If you've done your A and Bs, you truly have a them reason, not a you reason. And if you build a bridge, easiest way to build a bridge, ask for permission. Then we're down to encouraging them to connect the dots. To do that, I have four magic words to share. I'll tell it to you in a story. My wife and I got a phone call from an executive we greatly admire. He was such a legend at the last company he was CEO that they actually etched his name into the building when he left. Took a new job, CEO of another company. Calls us, maybe he's 100 days in. Texas draw. I'm not even making this accent up. He's like, y'all got to come out here because I'm screwing this up. And my wife and I, we're like, this can't be. You're, you're a legend. What do you mean? I'm screwing this up. You better get out here. I need you to teach this old dog a couple new tricks. So we go out. Two days we spent out there. End of the second day, get to his office. Well, lay it on me. What are they telling you? My wife says, they're saying they were thrilled when you were named as the CEO because your legend precedes you. Your, your reputation precedes you as a legend. But that you've been here 100 days and you mostly locked in your office and a couple of them actually said they couldn't pick you out of a lineup and they're starting to wonder, do you think you're better than them? And then my wife asked the magic words, four magic words to help people connect the dots. What do you think? What do you think? The reason it's magic is because after you ask them, you have to stop talking. <laughs> There's a saying in communication. The more you talk, the less they understand. So she asked them, told them all that stuff. People couldn't pick you out of the lineup, think you're better than them. What do you think? He says, I'll tell you what I think. That's a bunch of bull crap. I've been sitting here working my butt off trying to turn this place around. And he went off. Wife just sat there. I'm like, oh, I hope you have a plan. <laughs> she did. And finally he calmed down. What else did they say? And she said, they said they want to meet you part way, but they don't know how. What do you think about that? He said, I guess this old dog better get up out of this office and walk at least halfway toward him. And he did. We don't do this because we know it's going to be a little awkward for a little bit, but that overlooks the potential huge payoff. ABC, to separate the good from the stuff that goes boing. A, the them reason. B, build a bridge. Permission question, easiest way to do that. C, can't force it. They have to connect it. What do you think? What's your perspective? A year ago, I got a call from a relative her husband had been through cancer, end of it, stem cell transplant, end of the treatment, stem cell transplant to try to knock it back on its heels, and then boom, COVID. So basically, no immune system as COVID starts. And so he'd been isolated for months. And this family member was like, look, you have to talk to him. He's saying like, I need to get out of the house. I'm going crazy, cabin fever. I need to go shopping. I need to do all these errands. I just want out. I want out. You have to talk to him. 
Okay. Gets on his phone, we talk for a little bit. Eventually I say, hey, I hear you're thinking about running some errands this week. And he said, yeah, you know, I think I'm about ready to kind of get out and start getting a little back to myself. This isolation started to get to me, make me crazy. I said, well, do you remember what the doctor said about you getting an infection? He said, yeah, they told me that I have to be careful. And I've been super careful. And I said, well, do you remember what they said might happen if you got COVID? Stops. Silence. They told me I probably wouldn't survive. Silence. I haven't been fighting the cancer this hard to turn around and die from COVID. So I guess I have to figure out how to isolate myself until there's a shot or something. We talked a little bit more about ways he might be able to do that, not go crazy. And then, at the end of the conversation, he said, you know, I bet you didn't want to have that conversation, but I sure am glad you did. That was just the kind of talk that I needed. And I said, Dad, that was the least I could do for all the time you've had talks like that with me. He said, oh really? Name one time. And I said, well, <laughs> there was a time that we were out there on the grass and you know, I blew apart the thing and you came out and you said, don't be a jerk. Remember that? And I told him the whole story. And at the end, he looked at me and said, huh, can't believe I didn't spank you that day. <laughs> I knew he was joking just like you know he's joking. Because all of us, we understand the life changing power of negative feedback. Thank you. <laughs>